a lot of my social media for a while was about, oh, why didn't they teach us this in school? Why didn't they teach us financial skills in school? And like, I mean, not to get too conspiracy-ish, but I feel like, oh, it's so purposeful because if you don't know, then you don't make good decisions for yourself and then you can be exploited. I don't think that's conspiracy at all. <laughs> I literally think that is why they oh don't gosh. teach financial literacy. Yeah. There's so many of my clients that went to their quote unquote trusted bank mm-hmm. and they're like, help me financial advisor, help me. I don't know what to do with my investments. <laughs> financial advisors love those people because they're like, oh yeah, invest your money in this and we'll oh just take God. advantage of all yeah. of whatever you don't yeah. know. And the clients get screwed and the only people that win are the, like the rich people. The rich yeah. people. Oh my gosh. That was literally <laughs> what's happening to me. Success leaves clues. And that's why we're going to get personal with some of the most successful entrepreneurs, investors, and regular people to explore what they did to achieve their financial success. From each of these stories, you'll be inspired, motivated, and ready to take action to transform your financial reality and your life. I'm your host, Michael Lee Kim, a personal finance coach, CPA, digital nomad, and public speaker. And my goal is to help you have control over your money and your life. So if you're ready, let's get personal with money hello welcome to the personal with money podcast today we have a very special guest one of my best friends and current clients Zanny Sai and she is a scientific storyteller and freelance writer and editor welcome to the podcast Zanny oh my gosh thank you for having me it's really exciting to be here Amazing. Wow. so why don't you give us a little introduction as to who you are and what do you currently do yeah so As you mentioned, I'm a scientific storyteller, freelance writer and editor. Um, I'm sure like many other writers and editors, it means you do a lot of things. Primarily, I focus on health and wellness writing. So I like to write about, you know, complex like medical concepts, but then make them accessible for the general public. I feel like that really started for me um, a few years ago when my mom became sick. And this was right around COVID. So she wasn't getting the health care that she needed because, you know, the system was so inundated and they were so overwhelmed that it took her like much too long to get the care that she needed. And so during that time, she was resorting to materials online, you know, YouTubers, bloggers. And there's a lot of really good information out there, but there's also a lot of not great information out there. And as someone who studied science, like I have a background in neuroscience, I, I have the fortune and the privilege of having scientific literacy, right? I can read scientific papers or I can like watch the news and read newspaper articles and I can distill what is accurate, what's relevant, what's current, but not everyone has that. And I saw how that negatively impacted my mom. And so um, seeing her go through that journey really made me want to make scientific information more accessible, which is why I'm really passionate about health and wellness writing and why I'm why I'm delving into that. Mm-hmm. I remember during one of our coaching calls, we talked about how you always loved writing. Yeah. And you always <laughs> wanted to do writing in the future. Yeah. But then all of these people and all of these influences were telling you, don't do it. Yeah. And like do a traditional career. Yeah. But then you ended up doing writing anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So tell us more about that journey, about your love for writing and how did you end up doing writing anyways? Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I, I, I have always loved writing um, and I still love writing. And I remember it was in grade nine and I told my mom I wanted to be a journalist. And she was like, no, there's no money in that. You can't do that. You have to study science or like be an accountant. And like that dream was squashed. And I was like, okay. And I think that's what contributed to the to the loss I felt or the confusion I felt when I was applying for university programs because I think in my heart and my core, I knew what I wanted to do, but it wasn't a viable option at that time. Um, like I'm fortunate enough that my parents supported me through part of my undergrad education financially. And so I also felt an obligation to do something that they, that they liked or um, would have approved of. Um, and so I gave up on the journalism and like writing career really early on. So it wasn't even like a possibility back then. And then, you know, like studying neuroscience, like the years go on. 
Um, and during that time, I took a year off and I did an internship. So I worked with the government for a year um, with the Ministry of Health, which was a very different experience. I got to see um, like public policy. I got to see like public programming um, and a very different side to science than you know research in the lab. And during that time, I was doing a lot of writing. I was like drafting a lot of notices. Um, and because of my like research background, I was doing a lot of like, what does this research mean and how can we translate it into policy? And I really enjoyed doing that. And slowly, like as the intern in the office, like people would come to me being like, oh, can you edit this draft for me? Or can you fix this? Or like, hey, you did a really good job, like making that presentation look pretty. Can you do it for me? And I found like that was what I really enjoyed. I enjoyed taking information and putting it into my own words and letting other people see it. And when I ended up coming back to school the following year after my internship, I like pursued neuroscience because I had to finish the degree. There was no way after four years. <laughs> Your parents would like, be like, shut what you down. Like... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I had to finish it. But during that internship experience, I realized like, oh my God, my passion has always been for writing. And the thing that was different than like years ago when I told my mom I, would be a, I wanted to be a journalist was that I saw that I could be a writer in like any industry. So yeah, it was then that I decided like, you know what, like I really enjoy this and I see opportunities in this and I'm going to pursue it. So yeah, that was kind of the start to how I pivoted back into writing and editing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love how at the end of the day, if we don't... <laughs> pay attention to anyone's influence if we don't yeah. pay, pay attention to what society thinks is yeah. right for us yeah we truly know deep down what we want to do exactly. and what we desire exactly and it's like we spend all of this time going on this very like treacherous yeah. route yeah to end up just to where we are meant to be exactly are meant to do exactly I was actually I was talking to a friend about that because she um, you know, like she's our age and she studied business. She works at a big four company and now she's facing what I think a lot of people, you know, around our age feel um, is like she's just like burnt out and like doesn't like it. And she was like, you know what? I always wanted to be an animator. Like I always wanted to create animations. And like now she has decided like she's going to quit her job this year and pursue that creative passion which is amazing i'm so happy that she's doing it and it made me think like there's so many people growing up who have like full support right from their parents like they have an artistic passion and i think about like if if my mom hadn't said that if she hadn't squashed the dream of being a journalist that's something that i would have pursued from the age of 12 or 13 right so i would have applied for every like newspaper internship I would have worked at a publishing house I would have done all the things to like build my resume for the career that I wanted and I would have been able to give 100% of my energies to the career that I wanted from the beginning whereas because I didn't have their support I had to like you said go on this treacherous route and I was giving my like 20% of my energies here 20% of my energies here and it wasn't conducive to anything and like oddly enough I think it is tied to to money and like your money mindset, right? Because the only reason my mom even squashed that dream was because she thought there was no money in it. Yeah, it's a scarcity mindset. Exactly. So you can't take any risks. Exactly. Whereas if she had taken the risk and been like, okay, you know what? You're really passionate about that. And because you have the passion, you're going to put effort into it and you're going to be successful. I probably would be in a different place in my career now than I am. Not to say that I'm in a bad place now. I'm really happy. But I feel like I would be more like deeply ingrained in you know the writing realm because I would have had 15 years working with other creatives as opposed to have started starting when I was you know in my mid-20s yeah mm -hmm. I feel the exact same way especially when it comes to accounting like yeah. I studied accounting and finance and a lot of my peers they actually like accounting and finance good like for good, one for of my, yeah, good for them good for them like <laughs> one of my friends is a tax consultant oh my gosh I hated tax it was like the most <laughs> complicated thing it yeah. was so difficult yeah. and I studied it and I like passed the exam mm -hmm. but like for me to compete with her in a career she's going to surpass me significantly because she actually likes tax right. like she will study tax and will like perform it because she's like oh this is so interesting mm -hmm. and I couldn't give a shit about it and so same 
that's the thing. It's like at the end of the day, the people that are going to be successful are the people that are the most passionate exactly. about what they actually like. Absolutely. And so if you want it, in whatever career, whether that's art, accounting, tech, you have to actually enjoy what you're doing because mm -hmm. that's what's going to distinguish you from all of your competitors. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, not not worth nothing. Like we're lucky that we found these passions at some point in our life, right? Some people don't ever discover them or some people find them like on their deathbed. So at least we have the rest of our lives to pursue these passions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it goes also a little bit of privilege. Like we are in a very privileged situation where exactly. we do have the opportunity to think about what yeah. fulfills us, yeah. what makes us happy. Happy. that is true exactly some people like our parents yeah. like my mom she's a nurse she like had to work as, at a, as a nurse in order to provide for her family mm -hmm. and that was her way of being fulfilled mm -hmm. but like as her child and for all of the sacrifices that she did of doing a not very fulfilling career yeah. i feel like it's my responsibility to do a fulfilling career exactly. to make the best use of her sacrifice absolutely i feel the exact same way it's like it's maslow's hierarchy of needs right like they had to survive and now we're like okay we can we can thrive so yeah. let's make that happen it's amazing so after university what did you end up doing yeah and why <laughs> oh my god yeah so you know i just talked about like how i wanted to or how i discovered this this ability to pursue writing and pursue editing and then I moved to Korea. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I was like, oh. let's go to Korea. Yeah. Let's fly across the country and go to Korea. And yeah. How long did you stay in Korea for? I was there for, I was technically in Korea for three and a half years. And then I got to travel for like another six months. So I was gone from Canada for like four years. Yeah, I was like, bye. Haven't seen you in four years. <laughs> but that's okay. I know. Are you still alive? <laughs> I'm making it through COVID and everything. <laughs> Oh, man. But yeah, and ironically, going to Korea was like catalyzed by this new, this new decision to pursue writing. I knew like right after school, right after neuroscience, I was like, okay, I'm going to like need to like figure out a way to get into the writing and creative realm. Um, and, you know, I knew that I would have to probably do some more studying or like go back to school or like for me, because the only thing I ever knew was school. I felt like going to school for writing or a program affiliated with that would be an avenue for me to enter the realm. But at that point, I like was not ready to study again. I was like, I just spent like four or five years in school. I want to live life. I want to have things that I can write about. Right. Like I feel like most people, you know, you hear the anecdote, like writers only write what they know. And at that point, the only thing I knew was school, you know, and Canada and Mississauga and yeah, square one. It's a very small bubble. Exactly. Um, and I was like, I need to know more. If I want to be a good writer, I need to live an exciting life. So I have exciting things to write about. And I had heard about the Teach English Abroad programs. They become really popular these days. Um, and at the time, like I knew about Korean culture at that time, like BTS was like becoming a global sensation um and K south korea teaching english in south korea is a very like financially like sensible decision i think of all the countries at least that i'd researched um that you can go to teach english abroad in south korea affords you like the most ability to like save and i knew that i wanted to save to you know go back to school for writing and so i moved to korea um i ended up staying a lot longer than i thought i was going to originally i thought i was only going to stay for a year, maybe two. Um, and then the pandemic hit, <laughs> which was very different for a lot of people. And at that time, I like I knew for myself, staying in Korea was the financially like the most sensible decision because I knew, you know, at the time my brother had just graduated and he was like, oh my God, the job market is, it, it's really hard right now to find a job. You come back, you're gonna have to start, you know, from scratch. Whereas I had a stable job in Korea and because of the like the work culture in Korea, there wasn't really ever a full lockdown. So we never really like businesses never really fully shut down. So I was still like I knew I was going to be able to make money um, regularly and consistently. So in Korea, I've actually heard that it's quite good financially, like cost of living is mm -hmm. like relatively low for oh the amount God. of money that you pay. Can you 
Yeah. Can you talk more about that? I feel like, um, yeah, for sure. And I feel like I've seen the difference, especially moving back now. So I can (laughs) confirm. Um, I mean, I think, A, being a foreigner in Korea, there's, there's a bunch of different avenues people can take to work and live in Korea. I think teaching English is like one of the most accessible and the most luxurious because learning English there is so important for their education system that schools offer you so much right so the biggest thing is most schools will pay for your your rent they'll provide housing for you and so that's your biggest expense taken care of wow yeah yeah exactly um and on top of that you're getting paid a salary so you know your biggest expense is already taken care of the rest of your money is yours you have fun money exactly exactly um and that's one of the reasons why you know i said I think teaching in South Korea is the most financially sensible because I think a lot of other countries that have the teaching English abroad programs, I don't think they offer, you know, that cost of living arrangement or mm-hmm. that, sorry, that living arrangement provided. Um, so, yeah, and even in terms of, you know, going out and doing things that you like, right, your your fun money can go a lot further. Things are, honestly, I would say, like, between a third to, like, half the price oh. of, like, what you want. Like, if I want to go out and, like, have like a nice dinner and like a drink, like an alcoholic drink. I feel like here, I feel like I drop like 75 to $100. No Literally. apps, no dessert, no nothing. Literally. Yeah. Um, whereas there, like, you know, the same thing, You're probably like $30. In- and like, it goes so much further. So you can do more things and you can enjoy more things, um, which is honestly like, I think so important, especially like being young. Like you don't want to be cooped up in your house because things are so inaccessible right having fun is inaccessible and i think that's what made korea really exciting and why i have so many good memories there because you know your fun money could go so much further and i could build all these memories and and do all the things that i wanted to do to make life exciting yeah i want to dive a little bit deeper as to this disconnect that you had with Mm. when you came back to canada yeah so after four years in korea you came back to canada Mm -hmm. and there is a little bit of disconnect with the peers and your friends yeah. and your family members yeah. with the life that they're currently living and like the life that you wanted to create for yourself. Yeah. So tell us more a bit about that. Yeah. I mean, like I was straight up depressed. I told you. <laughs> it was it was really hard. Like so I got back in August of 2023. So like five, six months now. It was a hard time emotionally. Because I like you said, I'd spent three and a half years, four years, cultivating a life that was entirely my own for the very first time. And so I decided to leave. And it was, even though it was the right time, it was still really hard because I still had friends there. Um, You know, I built a relationship there. My partner is still there. And so I was leaving a big part of my emotional sphere behind as well. Um, And so much had changed. It was weird because it didn't feel like I was gone for only four years. It felt like I was gone for like eight or nine because I felt like I'd experienced so much that I felt like I'd grown and the life before the life I had before Korea felt so much more far, far away. It was also weird because I was talking about it with people who didn't, because they didn't do the same thing. Like I, they didn't understand it or like they wouldn't understand it. And so it was really hard when I came back because I was like, okay, the people around me, the people that I came back for, like my family, like they don't really understand what Korea was all about. They don't understand, you know, why I liked it so much. And they were also like not fully approving of it when I was gone too. So I'm like, okay, how can I talk about this with you? And then even the friends who were really excited about it, I just had so much trouble putting into words what I, you know, what I experienced. And then I also was like, oh my gosh, like, do I even want to stay in Canada anymore? Because now I feel like I've seen so much of what the world has to offer. My world has expanded beyond, like, just square one. And I'm like, oh, I can literally go anywhere and do anything. And so it felt weird, you know, coming back to a place that didn't feel like home anymore and thinking about, like, oh, I should be planting roots here because I told everyone I'm going to come back and, like, you know, I'm, I'm back for good. But it didn't feel right and it still doesn't feel right and that's something that i'm still navigating through Mm -hmm. so yeah yeah even with that like i did a two-month trip in mexico Mm -hmm. and even that two months of like my life like completely changed from that trip and talking to people who don't really understand what traveling like why are you 
traveling? Why are you dig- doing the digital nomad thing?、Mm-hmm. People who don't really understand entrepreneurship, like my parents, they're kind、yeah. of just like, oh, so how was Mexico? And I'm like, oh, we I did this and this, and they're like, yeah, let's change the subject. I'm like, let's talk about something else. <laughs> Literally, yeah, yeah. They're like, my parents are actually like uncomfortable li-、yeah. listening to it, and I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> like, I will like I'm sharing with you all these happy things, and they're like. We don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like they're not saying that specifically, but it's like, yeah, let's just not talk about、yeah. it. And like, it's kind of like your experience almost didn't even exist、Literally. to like some、yeah. of your closest friends and yeah. family. Yeah, yeah, which is very, very interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. weird. It is weird, and it's like, it's one of those things that you just have to accept that. You can have people in your life that you're super close to, but they're just not gonna know or understand that aspect of you or your life.、Mm-hmm. Um, and then you'll have people that do, and that's awesome. And that's why we, you know, that's why we have so many different friends. Is、yeah. everyone feeds and everyone shares a different part of you.、Mm-hmm. So I want to talk a little bit more about this life that you wanted to create versus the life that was that most of your traditional family or、mm-hmm. traditional friends have. Over here,、mm-hmm. what was like the discrepancy between these two? I feel like a lot of、um, yeah, like a lot of my family and a lot of my friends they they wanted to do their undergrad, they wanted to get a job right away, and they were like really focused on you know like like traditional career growth. So I want to. A lot of my friends are accountants, or a lot of my friends are are doctors, and so you know you, when you're a doctor, a lot of it is kind of laid out for you, right? You do medical school, you do your residency, you choose your specialization, and then You you do that right, or even if you're an accountant, you actually I don't know all the terms for it. You climb the ladder, exactly. You yeah, get a house, you buy a mortgage, exactly. Get married, exactly. Retire at sixteen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas like I after university was like I like I don't want to be here. I want to go and travel. I want to do other things. And so I knew automatically I was you know pushing back like you know buying a house or anything like that or planting roots down, and. I also like at the same time like the, I didn't know if those were things I wanted like I didn't know if I valued being a homeowner I didn't know if I valued having like you know being married or having a family even that young those are things that I still don't know if are important to me right I still don't know if I'm like oh do I want to own a house in the next like two to three years like do I want to get married in the next two to three years do I want to have a family like also how do you have a family in this economy like oh my gosh and so I think. Those are like really big ways that I think my life differs from a lot of my friends who have followed more traditional paths.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's like in Canada, it's like now your perspective has opened、mm-hmm. because now you have seen the rest of the world. Yeah, there are so many potentially better places where your money goes further,、yeah. and you aren't living paycheck to paycheck. Like so many friends and family that I know have. Spent their life savings to buy this little square of a place,、yeah. and they are spending the rest of their life trying to pay it off. Yeah, and this is—they're not doing it necessarily because they want to do it.、Mm-hmm. They're doing it primarily because they think they want to do it, and they think it's the only option. Right, or they think it's the right option. Yeah, for them because、exactly. they don't know of any other option. Exactly, but. One of the amazing benefits of traveling is that you do get to see different perspectives,、yeah. and you do get to see people living completely different lives than from、exactly. people back at home. Exactly, and I think that's one of the like really, really good benefits of traveling is that you do get that different perspective change. Absolutely, and then you get to choose.、Mm-hmm. You get to choose what sort of life that you want, and you can take certain actions towards that life、mm-hmm. if you, whatever life that you want.、Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And the, there's this concept called like geographic arbitrage,、mm. where you travel or you live in a place、mm-hmm. that has a lower cost of living, where、mm-hmm. you still get an income, where from a country that you're originally from.、Mm. And there are people who are able to save so much more money、yeah. and achieve their financial goals so much more faster,、yeah. simply because they're living a, where a place where it's co- cheaper cost of living.、Yeah. And so sometimes it's actually like a good financial decision to、right. move from your current place of country,、right. so that you can、uh, reduce your cost of living. Yeah. Not to mention our taxes in Canada is、oh、like、gosh. super super high. It's one of the highest. Yeah. 
and out I'm, of all the countries like yeah of like all the oecd oecd ocd yeah oecd countries it's like one of the highest and i feel like i'm getting no returns yeah like i'm paying and canada like boasts like universal health care oh, but it's like <laughs> oh my god like oh it's it's wild like actually this is something that i i'm going to i want to talk about okay. like i because you know i was in korea for a long time and obviously i had to go to the doctor there and the system there i don't you know i don't know all the intricacies of the system at least I, how i know it worked for me was y- you have an employer you contribute towards what's called the national health plan or the national health scheme and your employer matches so 50 50 and then that go- goes towards i think what is like their public health care system but like in korea you don't you don't need a referral to go to a specialist you can also walk into like any doctor so like if i want to go to the dermatologist i can just walk into the dermatologist and they'll have all of the equipment that they need there to like assess me and like test me and like give me my results right away whereas here it's like you have to go to your gp if you have a gp and then you need a referral to go to the specialist then you go to the specialist they tell you to get a test Which but then you have to go months exactly (laughs) but then even the test is like you have to go to like a different like radiology clinic to get your test or like a lab workplace to get your labs done and then your results get sent to another your gp again you have to talk to i'm like oh my gosh this is so inefficient whereas within 30 minutes i can have all my results and i'm like i feel like that's what i should be paying towards i should see the returns of what i'm paying for exactly yeah. I know so many of my friends, of my clients, parents who they get sick. Like they yeah. literally get diagnosed with cancer, like stage two, stage mm-hmm. three cancer in Canada. Yeah. And then they have to get treatment in another country. Like one of my it friends just so went long. to Korea. Oh my gosh. Another one of my friends went to Hong Kong to oh my gosh. get treatment. Because in Canada, so they're like, Yeah, it'll take um a few months for for you to get any sort of just to even see the next doctor. Oh my gosh. Because they're not, quote unquote, dying or on the deathbed. Right. Yeah. But it's like, okay, by the time they get to the doctor, they will they probably will be, be exactly. on their deathbed. Exactly. Yeah. And it's really sad. It's like, A, I understand obviously healthcare professionals and the system is so inundated and overwhelmed, but we have people who want to be doctors, right? We have so many people who are capable of being doctors and then they don't get let in because of the cap right on on medical schools and then they end up going to other countries right like it's there's more medical schools and the ability to study medicine is easier in the u.s or even in the caribbean and then we end up like losing that talent because they go to other places and then we still have a limited number of doctors and then people who need healthcare services we're paying taxes towards this right like i said canada boasts universal health care and then you don't see the return on the investments you're making yeah and some of the highest tax brackets you're literally paying almost more than like 50 percent of your income oh my god so if you're making like over like five hundred thousand dollars yeah you're literally almost paying more than half of your income to taxes and so this is the reason why a lot of rich people they learn how to keep more of their wealth Mm -hmm. by paying less taxes Mm -hmm. and as a cpa and as someone who studied tax like this is Essentially, the rich people know how to play the game, the tax game mm-hmm. of pay- paying less taxes and keeping more of their income. Mm-hmm. And so you would think that the rich people pay most of the taxes, but in it's reality, it's the middle class that wow. pays most of the taxes yeah. because the middle class are just regular people like my mom, like my our, our parents who yeah, work parents. regular jobs like a nurse or mm-hmm. like a regular office job. And they are the ones paying most of the taxes because they don't have access to these tax professionals mm-hmm. and tax consultants that are creating all of these financial structures so that yeah. they can pay less taxes. They yeah. just have to pay whatever Canada tells them to pay. Exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And it's like they have the financial literacy to make those decisions for themselves. I feel like um, a lot of my social media for a while was about, oh, why didn't they teach us this in school? Why didn't they teach us financial skills in school? And like, I mean, not to get too conspiracy ish but i feel like oh it's so purposeful because if you don't know then you don't make good decisions for yourself and then you can be exploited i don't think that's conspiracy at all (laughs) i literally think that is why they don't teach financial literacy yeah there's so many of my clients that went to their quote-unquote trusted bank Mm -hmm. and they're like help me financial advisor help me i don't know what to do with my investments 
they financial advisors love those people because they're like oh yeah invest your money in this and we'll oh just take God. advantage of all yeah. of, all of whatever you don't yeah. know and the clients get screwed and the only people that win are the, like the rich people and the rich people yeah. oh my gosh that was literally <laughs> what's happening to me until we did our sessions and i was like oh my god my money is in all the wrong places <laughs> yeah. so let's talk about our coaching sessions yeah together. so tell me about why you decided to to join my coaching program in mm -hmm. the first place like i don't have financial literacy <laughs> like i don't have the skills that i need or at least i didn't i have them now but i yes <laughs> but i you know i went like 25 like 26 27 years of my life not making the right decisions for myself because i didn't have the skills i needed to understand money and finances and coming back to canada like i you know I, I didn't really feel the the detriment of it or the i didn't feel the consequences of it while i was in korea because i you know i had a stable income and i it was secure cost of living was so much lower and i had a plan in terms of where my money went and how to pay off my osap debt and things like that but as soon as i moved back to canada and I decided to pivot into freelancing full time, my entire financial like landscape changed. And I felt so lost. I didn't know how to take control of my finances. And so it kind of like the timing of it was perfect, really. I was going through this huge financial transition. And this it seemed like the right time to to delve into it. Amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy that we we're able to work together. Me too. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So what sort of things did we talk about and what sort of things did you maybe what sort of things did you need help with yeah. in the beginning? I think um, a lot of it was under, a, under understanding my like my financial landscape, right? So like going from having an office job and having you know a stable, steady, or consistent income into freelancing, where at least right now for me, like it's more inconsistent. Like I don't get the same paycheck every two weeks from one employer, right? It comes from multiple sources of income figuring out how to manage that and then also figuring out how to manage my expenses because now like I've built a certain lifestyle because I enjoyed a certain lifestyle in Korea and living that same lifestyle in Canada is way more expensive right and so understanding how to navigate that what without sacrificing you know desires or you know being there for your friends or being there for your family um, and I feel like those were like two really big things and I think also I'd come back and I'd part of what we were talking about earlier where I saw some of my friends being in completely different spaces than I was even though we we're on different paths in a lot of ways I felt like I was behind them right they because they'd stayed here and they'd built careers for themselves and they'd made you know investments they'd built financial literacy and they'd built a financial landscape for them for themselves that I aspired to right they had an understanding of money that I didn't have because I didn't have to think about it or at least I thought I didn't have to think about it right and I was like oh my gosh this is like I can't keep living like this like I need to have that knowledge I need to have those skills and so even comparing myself to my friends I felt like I just need to learn more about investing and saving so that I can have the future that I want to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the beginning, we don't really see the impact of the lack of financial literacy. We're yeah. just like, oh, just living life and yeah. like trying to just get day by day. Yeah. But then as time goes by, as you know, some, some of your peers are going to be making investments mm -hmm. and like making certain financial decisions, you start to see the, the, the different paths exactly and where those different paths lead exactly it's kind of like we're both at the starting point like let's say you're flying a plane yeah it's like we, we're both in toronto and we're from the starting point and like they make a little degree change this way mm -hmm. and then you start to see like oh my gosh like just that one little degree change completely changed their direction exactly trajectory exactly and so that is really what financial literacy allows you to do it, mm -hmm. it allows you to change that trajectory so that you can end up where you want to be yeah. rather than somewhere you don't want to be exactly. going absolutely yeah i think also um for me like i came back and my brother and i he's like only a year and a half younger than me but you know I mean, he's a software engineer so they're in high demand right now 
Um, but I felt like he like surpassed me in so many ways when it came to, you know, finances, you know, he's like talking about making investments in this and that. And even though like he's open about talking those uh, about those things with me, I just don't have the knowledge to even understand what he's talking about half the time. And I felt mm-hmm. like seeing him do those things really reiterated, reiterated to me that I it's time for me to make those decisions as well, which like, you know what, like I will say being in in Korea and I think like doing those like live abroad and work abroad program sometimes you do get stuck in a mindset of stagnancy and you don't want to grow because you're like oh i'm having so much fun i want to live like this forever and that that's awesome like if you can do that and you can sustain that for the rest of your life good for you but i knew i wouldn't be able to sustain that and i knew that i couldn't keep living there which meant that i had to make decisions um, or different decisions in order to sustain a life somewhere else so what sort of things did we cover during our coaching session mm-hmm. that you found very valuable? Yeah, I feel like, I mean, so many things, like everything, like every single <laughs> session, I feel like I we I learned something or we did something that like changed the trajectory of my financial realm um, from learning how to track my expenses to which gave me a better understanding of like where my money is going and like what I need to change um, because it also made me realize like oh i'm spending money in places that i don't necessarily want to be spending but i didn't realize because everything was just so automatic or everything was so like thoughtless before um to like understanding basic concepts in the economy that i feel like i didn't know before um when we were talking about investing and i'm like oh like i don't think i i didn't know what a stock and a bond was (laughs) and i'm like that's Like, I don't want to say it's stupid because I'm sure there's other people that are my age or even older than me that also don't know. But, like, now that I know, I'm like, why didn't I know this before? Um, Or even things like, I remember you said to me, um, like, the people you talk to in banks, like, they're not actual financial advisors. Like, they're customer service representatives. And I was like, I've been leaving, like, the fate of my money in these people that are literally just salespeople. Holy crap. Like that stuff that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And so I think I think there's been just like a general or like steady increase in my knowledge of finances that built this bigger and better picture for myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So for those of you that don't know, the people that you see at the bank are not really financial advisors who are there to make the best decision for you, for your for your yeah. investments and for your future. They are literally just customer service representatives, which means they make a commission off of selling investments to you. So they are literally salespeople. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have to really sell you the best investment product. They're selling you mutual funds, GICs that are very expensive financial products Mm -hmm. that may not even be good for your financial future. Exactly. (laughs) And those are other things. I think one of the biggest pieces of knowledge I gained was like the types of accounts and what is actually beneficial for for me, right? So even like a mutual fund, like I didn't fully understand how they worked, but because my financial advisor told me that's where I should invest in, I had money in mutual funds for years and like that wasn't a conducive decision or like a productive decision for me. Mm -hmm. Um, Even understanding like what a high interest savings account was i'm like oh like i was like aren't all savings accounts the same and then it's like oh no you can actually like benefit off a savings account um and like you know the difference between like a tfsa and an fhsa that we talked about recently i feel like even just understanding the different types of accounts that was so far beyond my reach before not that i like could have like i obviously could have just researched it myself but i didn't like i didn't even have the means to do that Mm -hmm. Um, and I I don't think I even like had the trust in myself or like the pages selling it to me to give me the right information whereas I feel like working with you because you have this repertoire you have this knowledge I have the trust in you to share with me the information that is accurate and is helpful and is fruitful for for my goals Mm -hmm. yeah there's just so much information out there Mm -hmm. and it's is very overwhelming like there are like you know, so many different savings accounts. Every bank has their own savings account. Yeah. There are, you know, you can open up a TFSA with any bank. Mm-hmm. There's so many different ways and decisions that you have to make. Exactly. It's It really is information overload. And exactly. I think a lot of people get into this mode where it's like analysis paralysis, yeah. where they're just overwhelmed with all of this information mm-hmm. with YouTube, Google, that they just 
can't even make a decision. Like exactly. they're tired from work. They just don't want to worry about their finances right now. Exactly. You know, they just finished an eight hour shift. So it's like, yeah, we'll just do that later. Exactly. And then that later never happens. Exactly. Like, tomorrow <laughs> never comes. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Like even as we were talking about earlier today, um, when you have all this information, but you don't know how to personalize it to you. And I feel like actually that was the biggest like gift from this coaching, these coaching sessions is like you had the information, but then you could distill it and then apply it to me based on like information that you had about my financial realm, which is not anything that I could have done. I feel like whenever I would go to my bank and I would talk to the financial advisors, I'd be like, what do you think is best for me? Because I just, I didn't want to think about it. Whereas like now, like I could give you the information and be like, this is my situation. These are my goals. And then you can make the analysis and tell me what was best for me. And that was like literally all I've ever wanted in my life. I'm yeah. like, oh my God, thank you. <laughs> and the thing is this resource, other than my coaching and like money coaches mm -hmm. is not available to people from middle class families yeah if you go into the bank and you have over a hundred thousand dollars in assets mm -hmm. that is the only time when you will actually be given and seen with a financial wow. advisor wow so if you have anything under a hundred thousand dollars or like don't even bother that's so unfair yeah that's so unfair so the only people that are getting help are the rich people yeah. people who come from lots of wealth they have generational wealth yeah they are getting the financial support so that they can keep more of their money by paying less taxes and grow their money through the proper wow. investments wow if you have anything less than a hundred thousand dollars you're not they're not going to talk about your financial they're not goals. on your radar they're not going to help you choose the best investments for your financial future they're just like yeah we're just going to sell you what is beneficial for us yeah. and you're not going to even know because yeah. you don't have any financial literacy that is so exploitative <laughs> but yeah. it's like now i've taken that away from them which is awesome but that's like so sad yeah. that's so unfair Very i can't unfair. believe we live in a society like this and yet we do so i have to believe it yeah yeah so what do you how do you feel right now with your current finances i feel like i'm i have a lot more control like even after our first session i feel like Literally, like we we spent like two like an hour or two hours together, and then I literally like got rid of my debt. Yeah, like, I was like, you, you became one hundred percent. I was like, oh, I'm debt free like, after one hour together. That was pretty easy. <laughs> yeah, I was like, but it, and it was like, oh, that's so easy. But I would never have thought of managing my money that way or like allocating my money that way. And it's like, oh, you had the knowledge and you had the information, and then you made the decision that was best for me. Because I was thinking like, oh, no, if I allocate things this way, it's actually better. No, like that was stupid, really. Um, so I feel like I, I feel like I'm in more control and I, I love doing things. I feel accomplished when I when I finish tasks and I feel like after every session, there's been a task that I can accomplish that's within my reach and it's gotten me so much further ahead. Yeah, that is one thing I would say that you are very, very good at doing. Oh, yay. At taking action. <laughs> like, it's like, bam. Like, there's like some things that we covered in our sessions where I was like, okay, this is your to-do list. And like, literally like a minute after or like within 24 hours, you're like, yeah, I did it. I'll do it. It's done. I need the dopamine release. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I did something. Okay, neurotransmitters yeah. fire. You're like, that is paid off. Yes. Investment portfolio change. <laughs> like, bam, bam, bam. And like, that shows. And yeah. these are like the little, like as we were talking about, like the trajectory of where you're going. Mm -hmm. These are like the little changes that are like completely changing yeah. your end destination. Absolutely. Yeah. And I feel so much more optimistic about it. Right. That's something else that's changed is I feel confident now that I am going to att attain those goals. Whereas before I was like, maybe I'll get there. Like, I think it could happen if I do this. But now I know that I have the right knowledge and the right skills and that it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. How is that feeling of feeling confident and in control of your life change the way that you live your life? Like in the last year, manifestation has become a big part of my of my routine. Um, but it was always like based in ideas. And something that we worked on a lot was like my vision for my future, right? Like where do I see myself financially? What life do I see for myself? And you know, that's still something that I'm working on. Um, but I feel like it was a lot more wishy-washy because I didn't have the tools and I didn't have the steps that I needed to, or I didn't know the steps I needed to take in order to achieve that final version of myself. 
Whereas now I can see that version of myself or I can see multiple versions of myself and I feel like, oh, you know what? I have the tools to attain any one of those goals, right? Whatever happens, I know I'm going to be equally happy, but it's less wishy-washy now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thing about manifestation and a lot of people think it's like very like, very subjective like okay i'm gonna achieve a million dollars by yeah. like next year yeah but manifestation can actually be very analytical at the same yeah, time it's exactly. like you're creating little versions of yourself little higher level versions yeah. of yourself that you want to work towards exactly and you have to have that vision which is the manifestation point mm -hmm. but you also have to have the logical analytical point where it's like what sort of actions do I need to start taking to get to that point? Exactly. And that is also part of manifestation. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> like, things aren't just going to fall into your fingers or exactly. fall into your hands. You, don't. you have to take action with yeah. what you are really good at. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. And thank you for helping me take action in the right way. <laughs> You're welcome. It was my pleasure to help a very good friend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so... I'm curious, what is next for you? What oh do gosh. you want to achieve in your life? What goals and what manifestation life are you trying to achieve for yourself? Oh, man. I feel like, um, you know, in the short term, I definitely want to like rediscipline myself in pursuing my craft every day. Like I want to continue writing every day and I want to write things that I like really enjoy. Um, you know, I traveled for a big part of last year and there were so many thoughts and feelings that I journaled down, but I want to take those feelings and, you know, make them into, you know, actual thought pieces and publish them and share those, you know, ideas with the world. So I think in the short term, that's something that I'm definitely focusing on for this year is just being disciplined and practicing my craft every day. Um, I think more medium term, we've talked about this and we mentioned it a little bit, like, I don't know if Canada is the place that I'm going to, you know, stay or, you know, plant roots at um, and I've been looking at different places to to move to and you know we were just talking about manifestation and the steps that it takes and I know that we've talked about how I'm you know I want to consider moving to the UK and like for so long I was just thinking about it I was like yeah I'm gonna move to the UK but after this program I was like hold on I need to look at what I need to do and in, in order to move to the UK because you can't just show up like actually make it happen yeah exactly <laughs> I mean, actually, as Canadians, you can just show up, but then you have to leave after 90 days. <laughs> so if I want to, you know, be there and like start a life, what steps do I need to take in order to get there? I feel like that's something that I'm going to work on um, in tangent with, you know, my work and, you know, spending time with my family and my friends that are here and like seeing, you know, what part of the world I end up in, in next. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the benefits of personal finance. It's yeah. like, you don't know where you're going to end up. Yeah. You don't know what sort of life you're going to have 10, 20 years down the line. Yeah. Like you might have an idea, but like things are 100% going to change. Absolutely. But the benefit of taking care of your finances today mm -hmm. is that you're setting yourself up so you have those options. Exactly. So you have the flexibility to choose between living in Canada or in the UK. Absolutely. Or, you know, having a family or not having the family. Absolutely. You never want to be in the situation where you're like, oh, I have to stay in Canada. Exactly. Or, oh, I can't have a family. Yeah, like, exactly. That's a pretty not great situation. To exactly. Be. Yeah. Having money is having choice. Yeah. Which is awesome. That's powerful in itself. Very powerful. I love that. Amazing. Well, Thanks. if people want to learn more about you, you are a freelance writer. Mm -hmm. So if they have any opportunities about like writing or they want to learn more about freelance writing where can they find yeah they, can they find you awesome yeah um i'm on instagram that's like probably the easiest way to find me um maybe we can leave my at or something somewhere yeah. because it's hard to remember <laughs> my instagram is doses and diamonds um and that has a story all in itself if uh you do end up being interested and you want to look at my blog i share the the history of the name and the origins of that name but yeah, so I'm on Doses and Diamonds. And if you want to learn more about my writing and my editing career, you can go there. Yeah, feel free to reach out. Vanny is open to chat and Absolutely. open to meet with anyone. Yeah, I love meeting people. I love talking to people. And I love learning from other people too. So anytime you or anything you want to share, I'm more than happy to hear. Amazing. So I'll leave all of your, your link to your Instagram in the Sounds description good. below. So if anyone wants to reach out, they will reach out. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having this conversation. <laughs> I loved it. No, I appreciate it. And I feel like even though we've talked so much over the last like few months, 
I feel like we got to talk about more and I feel like I have more to think about now. Yeah. Which is awesome. This is the reason why I started this podcast for a selfish reason to like <laughs> just have great conversations yeah. with amazing people. Oh, You are one of my most favorite people. That's so sweet. You are too. <laughs> Love yeah. it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Personal With Money podcast. If you found any value with the conversation that we had today, make sure to share this episode with a friend who needs to hear this message. And make sure you subscribe and follow so you're notified when I release a new episode. Also, I'd really appreciate it if you can give this podcast a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify so we can reach and help more people just like you. Lastly, if you're ready to take action and have control over your money and your life, then come work with me in my private coaching program. To learn more, go to michaeliekim.com forward slash coaching or shoot me a DM on my Instagram and let's chat. That's it for today, guys, and I'll see you next week.